we base on on the seasons, which I think is is really uh, is really interesting. A um, little bit of a a little bit of terminology it helps to know is that um, you know the sun moves around in the sky during the year because the Earth is tilted in relationship with the sun. Um, in in the uh, Brightest and darkest parts of the year, in, in midsummer and midwinter, um, we call that time the solstice. Uh, and it comes from, I believe, the Greek. It means that the sun is still in the sky. And then in the spring and fall, we, uh, we have a time which the, the night and day are about the same length. And that's called the equinox or equal night. Now, if you were to stand in a spot outside your house and look up at the sun at noontime, um, this and some industrious person did that in this in this picture. They took many many pictures during the year of the sun. This is where it would be uh, during the year. So you, you can see it really does move. In the winter, um, it, it's it's at its lowest to be over to the right, and in the summer it's at its highest. And then in the middle, well, not really the middle, but the um, uh, between the two is is kind of the midpoint. So that that demonstrates, you know, where where the sun is in the sky. Um, and here's what it would look like if you uh, if you drew it, and and where it would be during certain months. Now there's a, uh, you know, that the egg is very is very very important to us. All over the world, eggs symbolize. Um, you know the er, the earth coming alive after winter it's the release of winter and the coming of new life and we always enjoy the first day of spring very important to us but there's an old myth that claims that you can stand an egg on its end only during the spring or vernal equinox when the day and night are equal in length supposedly this is because of some kind of equal gravity between the earth and sun on that day uh, unfortunately, although it, it works, it's a myth. <laughs> in reality, you can stand an egg on end any day. And uh, I'm, so I, I hate to kind of ruin that myth, but he, here's what's going on. On the bottom of an egg, you find little tiny, on, all, or all around an egg, there's little bumps on the shell. And these bumps are irregularities. And, and they actually hold the egg up if you, if you can balance it. If you can balance it. Um, so here we have it. Any time of year, you can do this. Um, it very much may, maybe when you were a kid, if if you were if you were a bad kid like me, we used to go to the diner and I used to you know pour a little bit of salt out and then and balance the uh, salt shaker to really annoy uh, you know annoy the waiters the waitress. Uh, I I would have done it today, but. <laughs> I'm fresh out of eggs. But anyway, here's one. I did this in the wintertime, and I was giving a talk at a, uh, actually in a church basement. And um, so this was, this was done around uh, November or December of last year. And sure enough, and, and the egg stood there, you know, for, for pretty much my whole talk. Um, I think somebody eventually bent, bumped into the table and it, and it fell. But uh, if, if it had been still, I, it, it would have just, you know, it would have stayed there all night. Uh, actually, before we get to this one, I just wanted I just wanted to give you a little more egg trivia. Um, if if you want, if if you can't tell whether an egg is cooked or not, um, you can uh, spin it, and if it wobbles, it means that it's it's raw and the liquid inside is is moving around. Um, there's an expression: "It's so hot uh, you could fry an egg on the sidewalk." Well, that would only be true if the sidewalk reached a temperature of 300 degrees. Um, you, you could certainly fry an egg on the, um, <laughs> on, on the uh, engine of your car, and I'm sure that's been done. Um, the eggs uh, not only have little bumps, but they have little pores like human skin. And through these pores, they absorb odors and, and actually flavors. So that's why we store our eggs in a carton in the refrigerator. Um, and eggs age more in a, more in one day in at room temperature than in a week in the refrigerator, so they do last a lo quite a long time. Um, and if you do accidentally drop an egg on the floor, uh, the the thought is to sprinkle a lot of salt before you clean it up, and that makes it, the cleanup easier. 
So there you know uh, probably more than you wanted to about, about eggs. Um, here's a, 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 an interesting home uh, somewhat near where I, I grew up. Um, it's called the Kirby Estate. It's in um, uh, Chatham Township. And um, uh, by the way, uh, to our moderators, I see it looks like somebody's waiting in the waiting room to, to come into the meeting. Can you possibly admit them for us? Thank you. Um, anyway, uh, it's a beautiful estate of a gent gentleman farmer. And when I was uh, just starting out uh, in, in business, I used to commute um, and, I, and I drove past this place every morning. And I found one day a, just a beautiful scene. It was very, very uh, kind of a cloudy, misty day. It was, it was right between uh, winter and spring. So it was, it was late winter, early spring. And although it was very dull, it was really an interesting picture. And I found the spot, or I, I kind of marked the spot mentally where this was. Um, this would be, uh, I, I think it was near a fence or something, and I was able to remember the spot so I could come back later and do the picture again. And I did. I came back uh, in late spring, early summer, and look at how uh, the world has changed. Again, it was a very kind of cloudy day, um, but this is uh, an, another really beautiful look. And then um, I came back uh, in early, early um early fall, late summer, and it looked like this. So you can see that the, the leaves had, had just started, uh, had started to change. Now I'd like in your head for you to visualize what this scene looked like in early winter. And you, sure enough, you got it. Um, and it made, a really, it made a really nice set of pictures. I called it Between the Seasons. And I actually, I actually sold a lot of these. Um, the, uh, I have to admit that I didn't get all the pictures in one year. It took me two years to get the pictures right. But um, it was still, uh, it was a really, really fun project. And, and you can do a project like this right at your house, just, you know, looking out the window, you know, with your phone. Find a spot maybe where the bird's feeder is or something and take pictures every, every so often. And you can really see how the, how the seasons progress. Um, this idea of commemorating times, uh, I, I guess the, the, the simplest term for it is a, is a postcard. And, and we've actually had postcards around since ancient times. And this um, you might recognize is from something called the Lascaux uh, Caverns in France. Um, and it's a painting of, a, of an actual event. It was a, a hunt of these uh, large uh, bison-like critters that were called aurochs. So someone actually took the time to scrape onto the wall of this cave um, this, uh, this event of the, the hunt of the aurochs. And people could look, look back like they would at the newspaper or at a postcard, and they could say, hey, I remember that day. And uh, hey, Grog, you, uh, you caught a big one that day, remember? Um, and not only that, but people have been signing their work since ancient times. Here's, uh, here's a signature on the cave of Lascaux, and it's, uh, it's quite obviously a human hand. This is the, probably, the, most likely, the, the people who did the painting. And they would you know, blow dirt through their hand onto the surface of the cave, and it would create a, um, a, a lasting impression, uh, an identity. You know, I was here, Kilroy was here. Um, the other thing that's interesting that scientists have found is that it's most likely that the, um, that the cave painters were women. Well, how do they know that? Uh, they actually, they know it because of the lengths of the fingers and um, uh, women's middle fingers are somewhat longer than their index fingers and their ring fingers. So it's very likely, and these are pretty slim hands. So it's very likely that the, the uh, cave paintings were done by women. Um, in America, uh, and, we, and we talked about this in, in, uh, in some of my lectures, in America, uh, we really got things seasonal celebrations going with the use of postcards. And that's due to the work of George Eastman, who founded Eastman Kodak, uh, Eastman Kodak in Rochester, New York. And he had a great slogan, which was, you press the button, we'll do the rest. Um, and this was, this was great, great American business slogan. Um, the idea was that uh, 
making photographs would no longer be drudgery and, and, or you wouldn't have to go say to a photo studio to have your picture taken anymore. It was now very democratic. You bought a cheap Kodak camera, you took all the pictures you wanted, you mailed the picture back to Rochester, New York, and uh, Mr. Eastman and his gang would, um, would develop the pictures and send you back your camera with new film in it. And it, it made photography something that everybody could use all the time. And I, I always love this, this particular postcard. Uh, this was taken in 1924. It's obviously three people who had Kodak Brownie cameras, a camera that you probably had. Um, and a, um, uh, we have these two lovebirds photographing each other with their Kodak cameras. And you think, wow, how quaint, how old timey. And then you think of today and it's the same thing. Uh, our social media is uh, very, very much like it was back in the, in the 1920s, only now it's electronic and uh, we don't have to mail the pictures back and forth. We just, um, we just transmit them instantly. Here in fact is what's regarded as the very, very first selfie. Uh, this is a picture taken by a photo studio on Fifth Avenue in New York. Their name was Byron. Uh, the Byron studio is still there, believe it or not. Um, but this was the, uh, the patriarch of the family with his assistants uh, taking a picture using a big, big um, uh, view camera, they were called. You know, you had to put the, you had to put the blanket over your head and uh, they, they squished down the bellows so that the camera would give a wide angle view. And here's the view that it gave. And it's a wonderful picture, uh, proof that, um, that when people get together, especially guys, they, fool, they goof around. <laughs> uh, another interesting thing about, about seasons and settings and things and postcards, um, if, if you notice on the, uh, the second guy to the left, uh, second guy from the left in the back has that pork pie hat and coming through it looks like, like two horns. Well, that's actually the, um, that is actually the, uh, the th cathedral. That's the cathedral on Fifth Avenue, St. Patrick's. So um, you do see that in these uh, old pictures, it's very hard to hide when they were taken. And I see that Gail Belding has raised her hand. Um, I, I guess Gail is, is free or, or could, could she pass the question along to, um, to our hosts? And uh, I'm glad to take the question now. You could probably un unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, are you showing charts or anything? Any charts about what? Anything you're talking about? Well, well yeah, the, the whole time we've been looking at slides. Are you I seeing... don't have any on my screen. Oh, Gail, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, please, maybe you could talk to Julie, but I'm, I'm assuming that everyone else is able to see the pictures. I'm so sorry. You've just been looking at ugly old me the whole time? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry. Um, so, but, so, oh, no, stop that now, honey. Uh, all Jim right. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to continue. I'm really sorry you're not getting the picture. Um, yeah. But again, I'm, I'm going to assume that everyone, that everyone else is. Um, okay. Our first season of the year is, as we said, the spring, the, the, the vernal equinox. And um, the spring has uh, a bunch of great holidays. The spring has St. Patty's, Patty's Day, uh, Tax Day, which is not really a fun day, but that's April 15th. Uh, Good Friday uh, in the Easter, and Easter Sunday in the Easter season. Um, we have a Cinco de Mayo, which has become a very popular holiday. And of course, of course, Mother's Day. Um, and New Jersey um, has a lot of, of great symbols and several of them are, are actually very much related to spring. Uh, one of them is our state bird, which of course is the, um, uh, the Eastern goldfinch. Uh, there's the female on the bottom and the, and the male on, on the right. Uh, they actually, um, uh, the, the both the female and male turn that color in, in winter, that sort of brownish color. But then during the summertime, the male gets the, um, gets the yellow, yellow plumage. And it's such a happy bird. And it, and it lives anywhere. It's, it's a great New Jersey symbol because it lives, you know, um, 
along roadsides, in fields, in, in any, kind of, uh, any kind of environment. Um, we are called the Garden State for a good reason. And here's a really great postcard. This is from a family in, uh, in Chatham uh, that, had a, that had a big farm and they raised goats. And there's, uh, there's the daughter of the family uh, with the goat who's called Bill. <laughs> She's quite happy to be with Bill, <laughs> as you can see. Um, in New Jersey, we actually have a state soil. Um, part of New Jersey, the top part of New Jersey, where, uh, where we live, um, is, is, uh, actually was formed by the, the last glacier, uh, the, the last ice age. And, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a, a rough area. It's, it's, it's a, a bumpy area. As we go south in New Jersey, we reach a part where the, where this, was in prehistoric times covered with water. It was it's kind of a shallow sea. And there's a different kind of soil. And this is the soil that makes us the garden state. It's called downer soil. I guess it's named after a person. Um, but the downer soil is, is sort of a smooth, deep soil, uh, which is easy to keep watered and easy to fertilize. And so that becomes our, um, that's our staple. That's how we, how we create such great, um, great vegetables. Uh, the, the honeybee is our state symbol, uh, state insect. Uh, honeybee, very, very important, not only for honey and wax, but, but because it pollinates our crops. And in fact, uh, we're at a time that the honeybees are dying off. This is a, a natural cycle, but it comes at a bad time because we need them. Uh, if we have to pollinate crops by hand or by machine, it costs like 20 times more than with a honeybee. Um, our state flower is actually spring and fall it blooms, and that's the common meadow violet, which is so, so humble and so pretty. Okay, uh, summer we have a little different, um, uh, a little different mix of, uh, of holidays and symbols. Um, we have a slightly fewer number of holidays, but really important ones. We celebrate Memorial Day, which is always the kind of the traditional start of the summer. Uh, we've had Mother's Day already, and now the next month we have Father's Day. Um, our big, probably our biggest uh, national holiday is Independence Day, July 4th. And then, sadly, at the end of the summer, we're coming up to it, uh, we celebrate Labor Day, which is kind of the official start uh, to the fall season. Um, and there's a lot of symbols that are associated with summer. Uh, you know, New Jersey is, uh, believe it or not, known for its great fishing. Um, and uh, this is one of our symbols. It's actually a, a dinosaur. Uh, it's the brook trout. Very, very uh, famous fish. Um, it's, it's, it's considered so valuable, <clears throat> excuse me, because it's very hard to catch. It's a very active fish. And it, um, and so it's a, it's a great game fish, and and we've actually sold brook trout all over the world, even to China, uh, so people can um, can play, uh, can they be fishermen and and uh, catch this this fish. So there's the, the the brook trout, which is a very very old old species. Um, another dinosaur, a real dinosaur, uh, was found in the summer back in the 1800s. And it's called the Hadrosaurus. It was named after Haddon Field, New Jersey. Uh, there was a farmer uh, who lived down there, and he used to uh, rent out his um, rent out his house in the summer for for guests, you know, like a bed and breakfast. And one of his guests was a scientist, um, a, a paleontologist, a guy who studies uh, dinosaurs. And the farmer had a big doorstop, a big um, big what looked like a, um, a bone and it was actually uh, they determined it to be a petrified dinosaur bone um, and so the scientists asked if he could bring in a crew to excavate and the farmer said sure and they found the spot where the bone came from and they excavated this whole uh, giant um, skeleton uh, and interestingly um, oops I went too fast uh, interestingly the the um, Hadrosaurus um, was part of this environment that we were talking about with the soil. You know, the soil was uh, with this low-lying, uh, with a shallow sea, 
and this guy has kind of a of a of a plate uh in his lip that he can that he can suck all the little um the little fish and stuff uh out of out of the shallow ocean our third um uh, state animal that is a dinosaur um is the bog turtle and this is just from a couple of years ago some some students got together with their science teacher and they lobbied for the bog turtle which is an endangered species a uh, very important turtle species small about the size of an apple um but it's uh it's uh worthy of saving and so that has become our state uh our our state reptile also in the summer um we have a we have a state seashell <laughs> the state the the conch conch shell is a beautiful shell houses a very unimposing uh critter inside uh but the conch is um is wonderful for eating conch fritters are an absolute delicacy of the jersey shore the other you know we've been looking down we've been looking at the world but we got to look up at the sky once in a while and right now if you look at the summer sky you'll see something very very bright and beautiful you see it every su uh, summer now in the winter um the the constellations are much brighter you know we see orion and and sirius the dog star but in the summer there the the constellations are not that bright there's the milky way um, but there's something that is um, is quite beautiful called the Summer Triangle. Um, and if you look up, say, maybe 9 o'clock at night, uh, at the um, uh, up to towards the, the zenith, up towards the top of the sky, um, there are three stars in a perfect right triangle. Um, the one at the top is Vega, which is actually the brightest star in the summer sky. Um, and on one side of it is... Um, uh, a, a figure that looks like a swan, which is called Cygnus, and um, the, the tail of the swan is Deneb. So you have Vega, Deneb, and then down at, at the right-hand corner, you have Aquila the eagle, and its brightest star is Altair. Um, so Vega, Deneb, and Altair make up the, uh, the summer sky. And within those constellations are some really interesting things. If you have binoculars, for example, and one of them is the uh, the actual eye of the of the swan, um, and it's a star called Albireo. And Albireo is a double star; it's a binary star. And if you look at it with strong binoculars or a telescope, you'll see that one part of it is blue, small small star, and a and a big um, a big yellow star. And it is really the most beautiful binary or double star in the heavens. Also. There's a, um, a, a wonderful, if you have a telescope, um, in, in by the, very near the, um, the star Vega is this beautiful nebula called the Ring Nebula. Um, and it's, a, um, it, it's, it's gas in the in a shape of, looks just like a smoke ring in a telescope. It's really very, very beautiful. Here's what the smoke ring looks like through the Hubble Space Telescope. So I, don't, I doubt you have one of those in your backyard. Um, but that's what it would look like uh, with a, a really big uh, magnified view. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, we think of New Jersey in the summer. Of the, the, our, first of all, our, our thoughts go right to uh, the shore. Um, the shore is where uh, all of us, as we grew up, we spent, we spent time. My family used to spend time in Wildwood and then Asbury Park and then later Long Beach Island. Um, here's a picture from Ocean Grove, a real typical, uh, typical shore postcard um, showing uh, lots and lots of people. I don't know if you're aware, but the Girl Scouts had postcards, and, and they're really great. Um, they had a series of postcards, uh, which had these little girls, and it had some, um, uh, some little wo woodland fellows uh, who would participate. Um, and in this one, it says, canoe trips are the greatest. And the uh, the first girl in the in the in the procession carrying the carrying the canoe is smiling because uh, she's doing her job. Um, the second girl is really smiling because she is shirking her job. She isn't even carrying anything. And the girl in the back notices this uh, because she's carrying all the weight, so she's not quite so happy. Um, 
Here's another, I, I, I did a talk, and, and I might have done it for you guys. Uh, I did a talk about postcards a couple of years ago. And uh, here, here's a wonderful one that is, is sent uh, to, uh, by a person to his, his uh, we hope his girlfriend in uh, Madison. Uh, it's from the turn of the century, and her name was Miss Lizzie Meyer uh, from Madison, New Jersey. And this is from 1906. Beautiful handwriting, very, very flowery. And if you notice, the stamp is upside down. Um, and that went, uh, that went to, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold off that one. When we, get, when we get back together, I'll ask you what, what, the, uh, what the reason for the stamp being upside down is. Um, but on the other side of the postcard, uh, Lewis wrote, roses are pink, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. And it's a very romantic view of the Mills Ice Pond in Morristown, New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey is also known for its horses. Uh, there's more horses per capita in New Jersey than there are in Texas, believe it or not. Um, and the horses in our state do very little farm work. Mostly horses are raised uh, for the race course. And that's a very, very popular, um, very popular summer, um, uh, summer activity for us. We also have a state tall ship, uh, which makes me think of summer. Um, it was called the A.J. Mirbaum, and it was named after a family that uh, they were oyster fishermen, very well-to-do family. Uh, that their, their ships uh, plied the waters of the um, uh, of the Delaware Bay, um, and one of the the ships uh, was um, it, it was. It was put into dry dock and, and it stayed there for many, many years. And a group of people discovered it and restored it completely. And it has now become New Jersey's state ship. Um, it in fact is a part of the, um, something called the National Register of Historic Places. It's actually on, the, on that list. Uh, beautiful, it's about um, 75 feet long. It's all done in oak. Um, and you can run away to sea. Uh, in the summertime, uh, the ship uh, functions as a research vessel, and you can join as a, well, as a deckhand, probably, if you don't have a lot of sailing experience. But you can join the ship and go out on um, uh, all sorts of projects that they, that they do in the Delaware Bay. Really a wonderful little bit of Jerseyana. And, of course, the Jersey tomato. Uh, now, the Jersey tomato is not our state vegetable. Uh, as it turns out, vegetables, I mean, tomatoes aren't vegetables, they're, they're fruit, but the real reason uh, is because we have so many other great vegetables that we produce in our state. But I loved, uh, now this isn't me, but it could have been me. Uh, my uncle and aunt had a wonderful uh, produce garden at their home in Madison, and we used to pick those tomatoes right off the vine and eat them. At one time, the Jersey tomato was the primary ingredient in Campbell's products. You know, Campbell's soup was in Camden, New Jersey. And um, the, uh, the Jersey or Rutgers tomato was, was a big part of that. The Rutgers tomato fell out of favor, ultimately because uh, even though it's still grown locally, it really didn't ship well to other parts of the country. It, it was too soft. It was too full of juice, had too much sugar in it. Um, it was too good a tomato to ship. And so tomatoes were bred that were more um, durable. Uh, and now, of course, when you buy tomatoes, they look like little red golf balls. Uh, but the, the Rutgers tomato was a, was a joy. And uh, you can still get it, in, especially at you know, uh, individual farm stands. Moving towards fall, um, uh, this is the time of year that I love because the, the weather starts to, to cool down and turn and turn crisp. And um, we have some great holidays in the fall, starting with Columbus Day every year. Now, Columbus Day with all the political things. It may not be called that. I'll bet, I'll bet it'll be called Discoverer's Day or something. Uh, but we have Halloween, which, of course, is a great holiday for the kids. The Veterans Day and topped off by, again, one of the really big holidays of the year, Thanksgiving. Um, and of course, fall is the time of the harvest, and our state fruit is the um, uh, the blueberry. 
uh, the high bush blueberry, uh, which actually was discovered and first cultivated in uh, a place called Whitesbog, New Jersey. A uh, family was named White, and uh, it was a it was a wonderful fruit, but it was it was hard to pick because uh, it was low to the ground, and it was also um, uh, it didn't bear a lot of uh, a lot of fruit. And and um, Mrs. White, um, she actually connected with the um, uh, with Rutgers and the Agricultural Service, and they they figured it out. And it turned out that uh, although the soil was already acidic in South Jersey. Um, it needed to be hyper acidic. Um, and what that uh, meant was it had to be fertilized a certain way. And when they did, they ended up with huge, beautiful, high bush blueberry bushes. And every blueberry in the world that's marketed is uh, what came from one of the White's uh, original bushes or cultivars, as they call them. Um, we recently have. Um, uh, we've, we've recently been legislating for a state beverage. And again, uh, the, it makes sense that it would be cranberry juice because uh, the cranberry is another great uh, product produced in South Jersey. Uh, another thing that reminds me of fall is our state dance. Um, and that is the Western Square dance. Uh, actually, several states have that as their as their state uh, as their state dance, and um, I, if you've ever been um, if you've ever been square dancing or line dancing, it is really really fun. Uh, what uh, happened over the years is that the the the, the caller, uh, who I think you can see up there in the right corner, the caller has become part of the show, um, and it's the caller who decides what the next dance is going to be. So if you're participating, you have to really pay attention because you never know what dance he's going to call. Um, I have another great story about the harvest, which I've told before, uh, but I, 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 can't, uh, I can't help telling it again. Uh, it's a great story uh, uh, written by Michael Pollan, who writes about agricultural uh, uh, history. And this one has to do with apples. Um, there was a farmer uh, in Iowa, an Amish farmer, um, who uh, grew corn like everybody else, but in the middle of his field was this kind of weed that would come up every year. And the farmer prayed to God to give him guidance about this weed, and God told him to let it bear fruit. Uh, and he did, and it grew into a stunted little tree, but it produced the most and best apples that um, anybody had ever seen. Uh, now, at this time, there was a big produce contest that went on in Missouri every year. And it was by a company called C.M. Stark. Um, and if Charlie Stark rated your produce as being acceptable, this, this would make you a lot of money as, as, as a farmer, if you got that stamp of approval from the Stark company. Well, uh, the farmer's neighbors told him to send, a, uh, to send a postcard to Charlie Stark, and here it is. Um, and they also sent samples of the, uh, of the apples. And Stark took one bite of, of one of these apples, and it was so sweet, he said, my, that's delicious. And that became, uh, the apple was actually named, I, I think it was named the Excelsior, but that became the, uh, the delicious apple, and it was the most popular apple in the United States for over 70 years. Well, Stark lost the postcard, and it took two years to find the farmer in, in Iowa. So you can see, even though it was a, if, even though it was a, um, a, a social network, the, the postcards, uh, they took a lot, it was a lot slower process than it is now, where if you try to find somebody, you can usually find them in five minutes on the internet. Um, and, you know, talking about postcards, we did have Photoshop in those days. And here's a picture of, of the, the harvest of, of uh, really, really big eggs that this farmer had produced. Um, in the fall, the trees, of course, change color. And our New Jersey tree um, is the red oak. That's the oak with the, the pointy leaves that produces so many acorns. And, and sometimes the leaves would turn a beautiful kind of mahogany shade. Uh, they don't actually fall off until, until the spring. Okay, 
Along comes winter, our, our final season of the year. And winter has a lot. It is replete with holidays. We, of course, have Hanukkah, Christmas, and Kwanzaa. We celebrate New Year's Day. Uh, in January, we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Uh, in February, Groundhog Day, which determines whether the winter is going to last longer or, or end quickly. And Valentine's Day. And finally, uh, President's Day, also in February. So it's, it's, it's a big, uh, not a month, a big, a big season uh, for holidays. Um, and it's a season for colds. <laughs> So I have a picture of germs, and we actually have a state germ, uh, believe it or not, and, and, and it's not COVID. Uh, the state germ is uh, the strep germ, uh, which was actually instrumental in the, um, in the building of the, um, uh, the vaccine for tuberculosis. That was done by New Jersey scientists, believe it or not. Um, another, uh, uh, another real great, uh, New Jersey tradition is the seeing eye, uh, which had its start, um, in Morristown, uh, New Jersey. Um, and here's, uh, uh, one of the founders, um, with a, uh, with the seeing eye dog coming out of the, coming out of the subway. And finally, we have a, um, <laughs> to, to round out the year, we also have a New Jersey cryptid, uh, a New Jersey mythological beast, and that is the, um, the Jersey Devil, uh, which is very, very scary to kids. It's been around since 1735. And the Jersey Devil, um, uh, well, it was, it was the offspring of a woman named Widow, or Mrs. Leeds. And Mrs. Leeds had had 12 children, and she said, if I have another one, it'll be the work of the devil. Sure enough, she had a 13th, and this is what it was, and it flew off, and they were never able to capture it, and it's still out there on cold winter nights waiting for you. Um, Christmas, of course, is a great, great subject for, for postcards, and I have a, a real old postcard of the saddest Christmas ever. Uh, this is a very sad young man and a very sad Santa Claus. I don't know what was, I don't know what went wrong before this picture uh, was taken. Um, Santa Claus is not only sad, but he's kind of shifty eyed too. One of my favorite subjects is Christmas lights. I just, I love outdoor lighting at Christmas. And, and actually I, I got some, some facts for you. Um, electrically powered Christmas lights uh, were actually um, from the United Kingdom. Uh, they they started in um, 1881 at the Savoy Theatre in in London, which was the first building in the world to be lit by electricity. And um, they put in uh, 1,200 incandescent lights, and um, the they were called uh, fairy lights. The first electrically illuminated Christmas tree was an associate was by an associate of Thomas. Edison, and uh, he was a um, he had Christmas tree bulbs, um, especially made for him. Uh, they were much safer than the candles that were normally used by uh, by um, uh, homeowners, which were very dangerous to put candles in in, in trees. Um, they became the real replacement for candles in in 1930. 1895. Uh, President Grover Cleveland proudly sponsored the first, the very first uh, a Christmas tree in, in the White House. Um, the, uh, over a period of time, uh, Christmas lights found their way into uses uh, all over the place. And there were many different, uh, here we have, here we are back in London. Um, and there, Christmas lights appear everywhere. This is in a, um, a beautiful gazebo in Chatham, New Jersey. Um, here, of course, is the Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center, which is a great uh, winter tradition. Um, these are the old-fashioned incandescent Christmas, outdoor Christmas lights, which I loved. The, the colors were so beautiful. Um, for a little while, uh, we actually had uh, fluorescent lights uh, for Christmas. I don't know if you had those in your, in your house. 
Um, and then we had the little lights, uh, which were very, very popular. And they gradually morphed into uh, what we call LED lights today. Uh, and the LED lights can be put anywhere. They're really quite beautiful. Sometimes they're hung like, they look like little icicles hanging down. We even have projected Christmas lights these days. Uh, so you don't, need a, <laughs> you don't need the lights themselves. You have the, the reflections of the light on your, on your house. And we have LED lights now that are done in the same style as those original, uh, those original large lights that I loved. Uh, here's a beautiful house that is lit really mostly by just candles uh, or candlelight and spotlight. This is a, a really interesting family. Uh, a fellow by the name of Carson, uh, Carson Williams. Um, and he got national attention because he started in 2005. Uh, this is what his house looked early on. He started really adding a lot of lights, uh, eventually got up to, um, uh, to 250,000 lights, uh, but they had to be, uh, they had to be uh, put in a Denver shopping center because they caused too much traffic. Uh, and Carson Williams' family was, uh, was, uh, got national attention on the Today Show uh, and CBS Evening News. But I still really, I like the old fashioned lights. Kitchens, um, another of my favorite subject. Kitchens around the world are very, very different from each other. Um, here's an Eskimo kitchen, which I'll bet is a little different from yours uh, in the winter. Um, but the kitchen is, is even, the, um, even the subject of some, some great American paintings. This, of course, is uh, uh, from, um, oh, I, lo I lost his name. I'm so embarrassed. You'll tell me when we come back together. Um, Rockwell, Norman Rockwell, of course. And he did four beautiful posters. This was called Freedom from Want. Um, and the others were uh, Freedom from Fear, uh, Freedom of Worship, uh, and free uh, Freedom of Speech. Um, beautiful, beautiful posters, but the kitchen is always very, very important in the American household. Okay, here are some other uh, here's some other holidays uh, that uh, th that I thought were fun. Um, they're not necessarily celebrated by everybody nationally, but they they've carved out a little niche for themselves. Uh, one, of course, is Black Friday, which is the day after. Uh, Thanksgiving this year, of course, wasn't wasn't a real a big one because of uh, people staying home. Um, but there's also uh, in that Thanksgiving weekend, Small Business Saturday, and what we call Cyber Monday when there's all the sales on electronics. Um, the Cricket World Cup, uh, which is done every year, I guess it's uh, probably on alternate years. Uh, we don't think of it much, but it's watched by two billion people on Earth. Um, there's another great holiday called Comic Book Day, Free Comic Book Day. And there's a skateboarding day as well, which I think is great. There's International Talk Like a Pirate Day, where everybody says, arg. Uh, there's, of course, Oktoberfest. Um, there's opening day of uh, different sports, mainly, mainly we think of baseball. There's Pie Day. Um, you know, pi is that, that value, the circumference of a circle, uh, which is 3.14. So March 14th, 3.14 is pi day. We celebrate spring break in this country, a big time. It's uh, very, very popular, especially down in Florida. Um, who, doesn't, who doesn't celebrate Super Bowl Sunday? And who doesn't have a hangover the next day? Um, we have Super Tuesday in general election years. I believe that's usually in June. That's when we have uh, a lot of the, uh, the primaries. Um, tax Day, of course, is, uh, is April 15th. But Tax Freedom Day varies depending on your income. Tax Freedom Day is the day that you stop working for the government and the rest of the year the money is yours. And finally, I don't know if you've heard of this one, 420 or April 20th is uh, Marijuana Day. 
Okay. Um, before we get back together, I want to discuss one other item, uh, this, this, which I mentioned, this great thing called the birthday paradox. Well, here's the story. In a set of randomly chosen people, you guys, some pair of them will have the same birthday uh, because there are only 306 po 366 possible birthdays, right? January 1st to December 31st, plus maybe February 29th, 366 days. The probability is 100% when the group of people reaches 367. Um, but 50% probability is reached, and this is the real paradox, uh, and I don't know why, but 50% probability of people having the same birthday is reached with 23 people. And I've, um, I've done this talk before and it's happened, uh, but I'll bet that with a group like today, there will be at least some people with birthdays in the same month or maybe the same week. All right, why don't we, um, uh, why don't we bring everybody back